Hi, and welcome back to Fire Ant Maneuver. In this video, I will briefly discuss the nations featured in our game, and hopefully give you some insight into the strengths and weaknesses of each playable army. When you first start Fire Ant Maneuver, you get three of these nations for free, and the rest you must unlock through playing quick matches or custom games. The United States and Confederate factions must be purchased as DLC on our Steam page. So first, let's start with the Prussians. I think they're the most popular faction in the game. Obviously, um, within the years of 1853 to 1871, which is when our game takes place, uh, Prussia's got a lot of wars to fight, and a lot of wars that they won. And um, this is also the time period where Prussia actually surpasses France as the dominant military power in Europe. They also beat the uh, Austrians in 1866, and they surpass the Austrians as really the dominant um, kind of influence in the German region. So Prussia really ascends to this great power status by the end of the game, and I think that's also why they are a very popular choice. So as the Prussians, it says the Kingdom of Prussia, they're intermediate, so they're not the easiest faction, but they're also not the hardest. They're balanced, they've got a, a defensive playstyle and an offensive playstyle. You can play them how you want. And they're also efficient. They make heavy use of the efficiency trait. So it says, formerly the Kingdom of Prussia, this new nation boasts strong commanders who lead a patchwork of well-armed units from across the German states, from Bavarian and Württemberg infantry to the dreaded Krupp artillery. But beware the short range of your fast-firing rifles and the danger this poses to your men. So obviously it's saying um, as well this new nation, that's referring to the North German Confederation, which the Kingdom of Prussia becomes in 1866 or 1867. Um, and so what you're leading here are uh, regular infantry as well as German state infantry, which include Bavarians and Württemberg uh, units. The Württemberg units are rugged, so they're good for getting through rough terrain. And the Bavarians have shock, so they're good offensive infantry. I don't believe that the uh, Prussians have any other shock units in their roster, in their infantry roster, that is, that have shock besides the Bavarians. And the Bavarians are exclusive to the late era uh, only, meaning Prussia has to become the North German Confederation before they have access to the South German troops. So in the early era, Prussia is not too great when it comes to shock tactics, unless they're using their Lancer cavalry, which they do have. They have Uhlans, which are a stronger variant of the Lancers. Um, as well in their cavalry roster, they've got Cuirassiers. They've also got Saxon guard riders, who are pretty good heavy cavalry. And their artillery is very unique. They have the best artillery in the game, but also some of the most expensive. We can see this one costs 360 points for the Krupp Mortar, which has indirect fire, five points of range as modern artillery, and is breech-loaded, so they can fire twice. And they've also got range drill, so they're doing extra damage. So the Prussian artillery is very good. And this is why they're considered a balanced faction. They've got very strong artillery if you want to play defensively, but their infantry here makes use of that efficiency trait, which allows you to quickly change in and out of formations, so if you wanted to advance on the enemy rapidly and utilize these breach loaders, you can play very aggressively or play defensively with the Krupp, so they're quite balanced. Um, and what also makes Prussia unique is that they get their breach loading weapons in the early period, which I believe they're the only country that does, besides the United States and the, um, and the Confederates through their Sharps rifles, which are in limited quantity. So really, Prussia is the only faction that can mass produce breech loaded rifles in the early period, but these breech loaders don't have much range, so they're um, not the best breech loaders in the game. By the late period, they're still stuck with those same needle guns, so they actually do a little bit better in the early period, but to make up for that in the late period, they've got improved artillery. So I'd probably say that Prussia excels more in offensive tactics in the earlier period of the game, and is more defensive towards the later period of the game. But ultimately, if you want a faction that's pretty versatile, and has got uh, heavy use of the breech-loaded and efficient perks, basically meaning that you've got two fire orders and two maneuver orders on, on almost every unit, then Prussia is a pretty good choice for that. The next faction we'll look at is France. They're easy, defensive, and well-rounded. So a well-balanced and versatile force with a bevy of units to choose from, including the highly durable Foreign Legion. But beware your foe's superior numbers and quality of artillery. So this is in direct reference to the Prussians, um, who might be fielding higher amounts of men, 
and much better artillery. The French artillery is not too good. The only way that the Prussians are going to be outnumbering you is if you're playing in the late period and making heavy use of the Chaspo rifle, which is both breech-loaded and rifled. It's one of the best weapons in the game. And France is one of the only factions in the game that can have as many of these superior breech loaders as they want across their whole roster, which as you can imagine could become quite expensive. So in the late period, you might be working with a larger force, or I'm sorry, a smaller force that is better equipped. Um, whereas in the early period, you might just be using smooth bore muskets and a couple rifles, and you can play pretty versatile. The reason we say this is a defensive faction is, especially in the late period, they are um, really making use of those superior breech loaders, which are very good at range. So you really want to maintain range with your enemy, you don't want to get too close. And as far as shock infantry, they really don't have much to choose from. They've got Zouavs, which have melee drill, but there's no um, massed shock units they really have access to. They also have the French Foreign Legion, which is a heavy infantry unit that's rugged, and they're quite unique. And the Grenadiers of the Guard and the Voltigeurs um, have got range drill. I believe the Frank Tiers uh, Skirmishing Militia also has range drill. So you've got a lot of good range options with long range units, and Typically, factions that excel with range don't want to be too aggressive. They don't want to get too close to the enemy. They want to maintain distance. The French also have a good cavalry selection. Three light and three heavy cavalry. Um, their light cavalry isn't special. They just have their lancers and their hussars and some skirmishing cavalry. And as far as their heavy cavalry goes, they've got dragoons, cuirassiers, and carabineers. The carabineers are some of the best heavy cavalry in the game. They've got shock and melee drill and maxed out cohesion and maxed out health. So these guys are quite durable. And as for their artillery, it's pretty limited. There's no modern artillery option. There's no breech-loaded artillery option. Really, the only unique thing they've got going for them in their artillery roster is the mitrailleuse machine gun, which can be quite effective. Might be a little hard to get used to at first. Um, it's an artillery piece that is not cumbersome, so you can move it and shoot it as much as you want. Um, but I don't believe this uh, artillery piece is breech-loaded, so you really need to... Um, uh, make sure that you land your shots and make those shots count. The next unit we'll go on to, or I'm sorry, the next nation we'll go on to is the British. And these guys are the most defensive, um, mainly because their whole uh, nationwide trait is drill. So we can see here, they're difficult, they're defensive, and they're drilled. Rigorously drilled infantry lay down punishing volleys, and the famed Highlander infantry from Scotland can repel any foolish enough to charge their lines. But beware the cost of your units, the highest in the game. So as we can see here, they've got 165 point line infantry, compared to maybe the French at 95, or even the Prussians who have, they have expensive line infantry, but that's 160, still lower than the, um, actually, 160, 165, so only 5 points extra. Um, but still, that does make them the most expensive line infantry in the game. And this is because every infantry unit in the British roster comes with drill. They were known as having a small professional professional force, and so um, you really want to stay at range. You, Anytime you're in melee, you're really wasting your uh, range drill capabilities that you're paying a lot of money for. Um, the only exception to that is really your um, shock troops with the foot guards and the melee drill troops with the Highlanders. So your guard units are actually more... Uh, suited towards offensive action, but the mainline infantry of the British Army is good for the defense, and they've also got modern artillery that's breech-loaded to back that up, so you can play into more of a defensive strategy with artillery working with the infantry to maintain range. The cavalry roster is pretty similar to the French, Hussars, Lancers, and some skirmishing cavalry, um, with three types of heavy uh, cavalry as well, all the way up to the lifeguards, which are just like the carabineers that have the shock and melee drill. So Britain is defi definitely more uh, difficult to play just because of how expensive their troops are. If you take any losses, if you make any mistakes, there's no real coming back from that. So the British might be a little more difficult. Uh, the French, a little easier. They're more versatile. You can kind of play them however you want to. Their line infantry don't have any perks associated with them. They don't have any traits. They don't have um, negative traits or positive traits. They're just regular line infantry. You don't have to learn the game in a specific way to use them. Whereas, again, the Prussian line infantry are efficient, so you've got to pay for that trait that you really know how to have to um, know how to make use of. And the British line infantry have range drill, which you've got to make use of. We move on to the Russians next, the Russian Empire here. They're intermediate. 
offensive and disorganized. Draw upon weight of numbers and the zeal of your soldiers to sweep the enemy from the field with aggressive columns of infantry, while the feared Cossack cavalry flank behind enemy lines. But beware losing control of your men in the heat of battle. So the Russians are a cheaper option than both the French, British, and Prussians. Their infantry are cheap, cheaper than the three previous nations we've discussed at 85 points, and they've also got some cheap militia at 50 points. If we compare here, I believe the British militia is 125, French militia is 90, Prussian militia is 125, so we've got the cheapest militia so far. And the trait that makes Russia unique is that just about all of their infantry, or really almost all their units, have the disorganized trait, which means they regain cohesion um, at a slower rate than the other nations. So that can be an issue for the uh, Russian army that you're going to have to deal with. Because you're regaining cohesion at a slower rate than your enemies, you might as well not play on the defense because the enemy can keep your cohesion pinned down and rack up kills faster than other countries. But if you're engaged offensively and regaining cohesion isn't even a concern of yours, then that would be great for the Russians. So you want to stay offensive because that disorganized trait won't even hurt you if you're not even going to regain your cohesion anyways. So forming attack columns, pushing the enemy, and not giving them a chance to breathe, that's what the Russians are good for, and they've got a lot of men to do it. So they're a little more expendable, not the most expendable in the game, uh, but they are more expendable, and they do have some more expensive options. These grenadiers are 150 points. They're not bad. Um... We go to the cavalry. Again, we've got three light cavalry options, three heavy. The chevaliers are pretty good, but they are disorganized. And their artillery isn't too bad either. They've got Gorlov guns, which is the Rus Russian equivalent of Gatling guns, and they've got modern breech-loaded artillery, so not too bad either. The next nation we'll move on to are the Ottomans here. And the Ottomans are an even cheaper option than the Russians. They are difficult, offensive, and expendable. So while the Russians may have, be cons while the Russians may have been considered maybe more intermediate, because you can sustain some losses. The Ottomans are actually a little more difficult because you're going to sustain a lot of losses and that might stack up so high that your whole force kind of falls apart before you have a chance to really engage the enemy. So unlike the Russians, instead of being disorganized among all their troops, all of their troops are easily broken. That's the trait that they receive, which means that for any turn that they're at zero cohesion, whether that's away from the enemy or close to the enemy in offensive action, they just take an extra HP loss. So if they're pushing, just like the Russians are, and, and really trying to negate their negative trait, they're still going to be taking losses. So they essentially need to be even more aggressive than the Russians and really try to drive their enemy off the field and avoid any incoming fire, lest their troops just start bleeding. Um, just from having low cohesion. So you have to be very careful with uh, the Ottoman troops, but they are quite, uh, quite cheap. And just like the Russian militia at 50 points, the Ottoman militia is also at 50 points. Um, Russian line infantry is at 85, but Ottoman line infantry is at 80, so a little bit cheaper. And the cavalry is a little more unique for the Ottomans as well. They've got four light cavalry and two heavy cavalry, so definitely more of a light cavalry focus for the Ottomans. Um, slightly easier to kill for that reason, but that's kind of their whole faction-wide trait, is that they've got weaker units. So you've just got to be very careful and move very offensively and very quickly with this uh, vast lineup of light cavalry. Their artillery is pretty good, actually, too. In the late period, they actually get access to imported German Krupp artillery, though it's got a bit shorter range than the German uh, higher-quality Krupp artillery. So they're kind of getting the hand-me-downs of, uh, of the German Krupp. Um, they also get their variant of a Gatling gun in the late period as well. So we can read here, fill in the battlefield, or fill the battlefield with your forces, comprising a seemingly endless tide of militiamen, including the bizarre Bashi Bazooks, known in the West as the Crazy Heads, but beware the lack of discipline endemic to Ottoman armies. So that's just something to watch out for. Um, the Ottomans are difficult, offensive, yet expendable. The next nation we move on to is another beginning friendly nation, the Austrians. Um, very similar to the French, actually. They have very conventional style line infantry. These German line infantry here in red um, don't have any traits associated with them, so you don't have to push yourself toward any specific play style. But you will notice, just like the Austrian flag is divided between Austria and Hungary, red and green, you notice their two line infantry, German infantry in red, Hungarian line infantry in green, they're right next to each other and they 
um, they play very different. So you can either field a Hungarian army, all of whom have the shock perk and play very offensively, or go with the more vanilla style German line infantry as well. So you, you kind of have uh, two options there, quite versatile, similar to the French in their versatility. They've also got in the early period some German South, uh, some South German troops here. The um, I believe it's the Saxons and the Bavarians that they've got access to. And then a huge, huge array of skirmishers. Um, they've got Grenzers, Kaiserjägers, Feldjägers as well. So a big emphasis on versatility and shock, but also skirmishing. Um, and that makes them more distinguished uh, from the French as a starter nation. Their Hock and Deutschmeisters are the only heavy infantry in the game that have all of its focus placed in melee, which have melee drill, shock, and efficiency to quickly get into an attack column and push on the enemy. So you can play the Austrians very offensively with the shock units, or you can kind of maintain distance with your skirmishers, or a bit of both. And that said, Austria is about finding the balance between two forces in one army, including expert skirmishers to engage your opponents at long range. But beware this sole advantage becoming a liability as the fight draws closer and closer. So when I mentioned the shock trait being uh, on a few Austrian units, well, shock can only be used offensively. If you, you, if you yourself are charged, the shock perk doesn't come in to help you. So maybe having a lot of these troops that are spread out and meant for skirmishing with some offensive infantry isn't good if you yourself are being charged by the enemy because your shock, your shock units won't be as useful and your skirmishers are just going to fall apart if they're charged. So you have to be careful that you aren't um, attacked by an offensive nation yourself as the Austrians. That might be a challenge for you. The cavalry lineup is pretty standard, um, but we've actually got four light cavalry units and two heavy cavalry with no... Um, special heavy cavalry units, so really your emphasis here is on lighter, swifter units and the volunteer Uhlans and the volunteer Hussars being cheaper variants of the regular Hussar and regular Lancer variants. The artillery of Austria is actually quite good. Um, surprisingly, um, even though it doesn't look like a lot, all of their artillery has indirect fire, so even though they don't get modern artillery, Every, all of their artillery pieces can fire over their line, which makes Austria really, really difficult to break through their lines when even the regular field artillery is able to basically work as howitzers and field artillery at the same time. They also get, as of now, a range drill on their heavy artillery, so you've got expert artillerists firing guns that are versatile. Um, they can fire directly or indirectly onto the enemy, and yeah, that can be quite deadly to defend themselves with. So... They can actually hold a pretty good defensive line, but when it comes time, use those shock infantry troops to push into the enemy and counterattack when the time's ready. They are easy, defensive, and good at skirmishing. Now we move on to the Italians, the Kingdom of Sardinia Piedmont. They are difficult, offensive, but also good at skirmishing. Nationalism allows you to draw on expert mountain troops and political paramilitaries both. But beware your specialized troops' lack of professionalism. So, similar to the Russians, but also the Austrians, the Russian or the Italians have got disorganized line infantry on about half of their infantry, but the other half are efficient, which is actually quite similar to the Prussians with the red shirts having efficiency. But like the Austrians, they have three good skirmisher options. So they're really drawing from the Prussians with the red shirts the Austrians with their skirmishers, and the Russians with their line infantry. So if you're a fan of those three factions, Italy might be perfect for you as they combine all of those elements together. And their light cavalry is actually similar to the United States and Confederate cavalry. They've got the only... Um, ah, what is it? I think they've got the only skirmishing... No, it's the only rugged light cavalry in Europe. So of all of the base game nations, they've got the only rugged light cavalry, which I believe are the mounted guides, which is similar to the light cavalry focus the United States and the Confederacy has. So they really draw from a lot of different nations in that regard. Um, as far as heavy, or, uh, heavy cavalry goes, there's really not too much to choose from. And for artillery, there's not too much to choose from either. They're probably one of the weakest factions in term, terms of artillery. There's no machine guns. There's no modern artillery. Um, there's nothing of that sort. 
Though in, an, in a coming update, we do plan on adding mountain guns to the Italian roster, giving them uh, rugged artillery to use, which can be quite good. Uh, what is fun about the Italians is just like the Austrians are using Hungarian or German line infantry, the Italians can either use red shirts or they can use regular line infantry or a bit of both. There's no real limits on the usage of those troops. So you can play them pretty uh, versatile. And I would say they are more offensive because of that disorganized trait being applied to most of their troops. And the troops that aren't disorganized have really low health or uh, cohesion, so they can't take much of a beating from afar. Whereas, let's say the British, you get a an army of uh, Highlanders and foot guards, and no matter how, how many times the enemy artillery is hitting you across the map, these guys can hold the line much longer than, let's say, a, uh, an Italian force of red shirts. The last two factions we have to go over are the United States and the Confederates. So with the United States, we have an intermediate, balanced, and incohesive faction. The Union Army is a flexible and affordable faction featuring a variety of specialized troops drawn from all corners of their young nation, ranging from Custer's rapid-firing cavalry brigade to the lethal U.S. sharpshooters, but beware the difficulties of coordinating such a large, incohesive body of troops. So similar to the Russians and Ottomans, they do have quite cheap uh, units to pull from. I believe the Russians have got 50-point militia, Ottomans have got 50-point militia, the French have 90 points, but right in the middle there, the U.S. has 60-point militia, so not quite as cheap as the Russians and Ottomans, and really there's no disorganized or easily broken traits among the U.S. infantry to worry about as well, but unlike any of the other nations, the United States has no heavy infantry at all in their entire roster, and their standard line infantry has the same cohesion as most European nations' militia does. So as far as holding a line from... Uh, on, on defense against a European nation, it might be way more difficult for the United States to do that. But they aren't working with disorganized or easily broken as much throughout their infantry. They can uh, draw from the Irish Brigade for a good shock unit, Zouaves for a good melee drill unit, skirmishers to uh, hold the line in front, and then sharpshooters are actually one of the only nations, actually I believe the only nation in the game, the only unit in the game to utilize breech loading and rifle in the early period. So this is a very valuable unit, even into the late period of the game. The regulars and the iron brigade are good options for more sturdy troops, if you don't want to rely on the cheaper volunteers. And as for cavalry, there is no heavy cavalry. It's all light cavalry. Um, they're all quite different. Some are easily broken. Some are disorganized. Some don't have those traits. Some have shock. So you've got a lot of options between your light cavalry, and I believe in a future update we are going to add Buffalo Soldiers, which is going to be another addition to the United States light cavalry. So you're going to have a, a lot of options in the future. I believe we're, we've also considered adding mountain guns to the Union and Confederate artillery rosters as well, which will give them more artillery choices, because the Union and the Confederacy right now don't have any modern breech-loaded artillery, but they can use Gatling guns. So yeah, I would say what to watch out for with the United States is that low cohesion level. And so you might want to be offensive if you're going against European armies or quality-focused European armies. But if you're going against someone maybe like the Ottomans or the Confederates or another United States player, you can be more defensive. Um, so they've got more of a balanced play style, but probably leaning slightly more offensive against the quality nations. Going to the last nation, we have the Confederate snake here. Uh, Confederate States of America are difficult, offensive, and also incohesive. The South prides itself on the offensive spirit of its soldiers, who, if led properly, can rout a superior enemy through audacious maneuvers or disrupt his interior lines with rugged cavalry. But beware the limits which your economy places on the number of incohesive men you can field. So, similar to the United States, you don't have any heavy infantry to pull from, and your cohesion of your regular line infantry is that of European militia. It's only got three cohesion, so they really can't sustain many hits before troops start getting killed. But you might notice, despite having militia-level cohesion troops, their line infantry costs 100 points, which I believe is more than Russian line infantry, more than Turkish line infantry, more than Italian, um, but cheaper than Austrian and French. 
Um, actually, five points uh, more expensive than French line infantry. That's interesting. 95 for the French line infantry, 100 for the Confederate States. So if you're wondering how these incohesive troops are so expensive, and as we were saying in this description, uh, the limits of your economy, you really can't afford a lot of these troops. It's because the Confederates are very similar to, to the United States with low cohesion troops, but they're also super similar to the Germans by having the efficiency trait among all, almost all of its units. So if you want to be really aggressive, you're not going to have as much flexibility as the Prussians do playing super defensive or super offensive. Um, but if you really want to go on a large-scale offensive, swap between formations, and trick your opponent of where you're going to move, then these troops are quite good for that as they're efficient. But you can't get a lot of them. So I would say if you're better at the game, um, that's why they're difficult here. If you're better at the game, going with the Confederates over the United States, if you can avoid taking a lot of losses, um, could be quite good if you're using that efficiency trait. But if you're a little newer and you aren't sure how to make full use of that efficiency trait to... Um, move in uh, unpredictable ways, then I would go with the United States, whose infantry is only 75 points. So a big difference there. Um, as far as notable units go, they've got the Texas Brigade, which are rugged infantry. They've got Stonewall Brigade that has range drill. Um, and then they've got a whole lineup of light cavalry as well, including Bushwhackers, who I believe have rugged uh, as well. So Almost got a little bit of Italian influence in the amount of rugged troops that they can field. And they've got two decent skirmishing infantry options. Though I wouldn't really say these uh, the picket infantry is, um, is a very good option. Though the Whitworth sharpshooters are quite good in the Confederate roster. As far as artillery goes, not too much going on here. Um, no modern artillery either. But as I said in a future update, they might be getting uh, mountain guns as well as Texas Rangers for another light cavalry option as well. So really some roster changes coming to the Italians, the United States, and the Confederates. To conclude, I would say that the Prussians here, they're intermediate. I would say you could start the game off with playing with the Prussians, but you really have to be careful because they do have expensive units. So you're really, you, you, you are going to be outnumbered often, especially the artillery. So if, um, if you're going to take losses easily and you're newer to the game, it might be a little trickier with the Prussians, but they are fun to play. The French are a very good option for a new player because they've got no negative traits applying across their whole army, but they also don't have positive traits that force you to play in a specific way. So they, they're quite versatile, and in the late period, there's no limits on the guns that you can buy for the superior breech loaders, so you can keep range at the enemy and use those uh, good chaspo rifles to pin down enemy forces. The British are a little more difficult. If you take any losses, that's going to be a serious blow to your army. You're always going to be outnumbered as the British, so be careful for that. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that as a starting nation. Russia or the Ottomans, or even really the Italians here, are also okay options as uh, intro nations. Um, they've all got negative traits applying to most of their line infantry, so you really can't sit back and let your enemy take control of the board because they're just going to pin your forces down and slowly whittle away your troops. So you've really got to be careful playing those three nations. They might be a little more difficult. Austria is a good alternative if you're not a fan of France. They're a little more focused. They're more specialized than the French, but they've also got the vanilla line infantry as well that don't have a specific way that they need to play. So Austria is also a good opening faction. Lastly, we have the United States and the Confederacy. They're a little more difficult. The cohesion is so low that if you don't know how to play the game, you're just going to be taking losses left and right, and you're not going to understand why that's happening. So maybe not good first options, but you can field a lot of U.S. troops. So even if you do, do take those losses, it's not going to be the end of the world for the United States. But the Confederates are quite difficult because you've got expensive troops that can die very quickly. They don't have negative traits that bleed their units over time or pin down their cohesion, but just in general, their cohesion is low, and the traits that their troops come with, such as efficiency, are expensive. So you're dealing with troops that can only take a few hits of damage, and they're going to be um, far fewer than enemy troops fielded on the battlefield. So I hope that's helpful. That goes over all of the nations in the game, and I hope that influences... Um, what kind of nations that you want to bring in on your first try for fire and maneuver. And if you have any questions, head over to the comment section or join our Discord, and you can discuss the nations in the game there further. Thank you.